There are great platforms that let you record both sides so you get the best quality from both sides. And that's a huge innovation that was now made available to everyone. Like that before that was, you know, you'd have to ask your guest to like, you know, record it on their side. And, you know, now it's much more seamless. So I think all those things make for better sound quality. Podcast Junkies, episode 253. Welcome back. I'm your host, Harry Duran. We are beginning March, the third month of 2021, and I'm wondering how many people thought just how different or not this year would go, depending how things went for you last year. Regular listeners may or may not know that it was a challenging 2021 early on when I lost my best friend from high school. We had fallen out of touch and he ended up being a casualty of COVID. And he's my age. I just turned 50 last October 2020. And that's been an interesting journey in and of itself. So I think it's been something that I'm going to be more cognizant of sharing some of my journey here on this podcast. That's how this show started. I was sharing things that were going on in my life. You may uh, remember early listeners, my dog, Disco Yorkie, from a previous marriage and he passed as well last year. So it's been a crazy, crazy year for me. And I think sometimes I lose fact of the connection I have with you as my listener on this podcast and the opportunity that I have to share uh, what's happening for me so that it's not just a host interviewing a guest and you don't feel like you're learning or growing along with me. And that's something that I always am cognizant of. So I'll, I'll be doing a little bit more of that. Personally, things are going well with our agency, Fullcast, which you've heard me mention several times in the intros and outros of this show. And so I'm grateful and always have an abundance mindset when it comes to things like that, that I know that's not been as good for folks past year and some businesses have been doing well and some not. So the fact that ours is, is something that I'm grateful for every single day and interested to hear more of your stories as well. So my email is always open, harry at podcastjunkies.com. I'm active on LinkedIn, active on uh, Twitter, especially. And yes, yeah, so you can connect and DM me via the Podcast Junkies Instagram or uh, Twitter account anytime you have a comment and want to talk about anything cool that you heard in the world of podcasting or something that inspired you from these episodes. Last week, I had a friend on, Shelby Stanger. She's a journalist and adventurer and creator of the Wild Ideas Worth Living podcast and her new show, Vitamin Joy. I actually helped launch Wild Ideas Worth Living years ago for Shelby, and it was so exciting to see that show grow. She eventually took the production on in-house, was able to find a sponsorship, and eventually partner with REI, who now owns the show, and she continues on as host. So that's been really fun to to watch and to see her and to still call her a friend. I'm really grateful for that. So make sure you check that out. That's the last episode, episode 252. This week, another woman doing amazing things. Her name is Nital Parekh, and we connected through a tool called Lunch Club, which I mentioned previously on this show. And it's an interesting networking tool where I've met a lot of fascinating folks, entrepreneurs doing really, really cool things, and Nital was one of them. In this episode, she talks about her experience in digital content creation and community building, and as the host of the Impact Podcast, which is a show that explores social impact stories and interviews and reflections to help others reach their impact potential. We discuss how the podcast has been a vehicle for social change and corporate responsibility, naturally the impact of COVID, and because she's been doing this for a while and has been really successful at it, we talk about some of the tools, apps, and best practices. This episode is brought to you by Focusrite and specifically the Scarlet 2i2 sound card, one of my favorite go-to sound cards, something I use for each and every podcast recording. The 3G line is a go-to for all new podcasters. Find out more at podcastjunkies.com forward slash Focusrite and the link will be in the show notes as well. We start off, funny enough, with her passion for yoga and how that's actually helped her get through a challenging few months. We learned what inspired Nital to pursue an education with a strong focus on social impact and change, and a little bit about how to identify companies that are that have a strong corporate social responsibility mandate. We learned about how she started Innovate Social and the direction she sees the company continuing to grow in. 
We really had a great conversation. We're going to look to do some sessions together on Clubhouse. If you have not heard <laughs> or you've been under a rock, Clubhouse is a really interesting tool and it allows us to have uh, audio only conversations, which for the most part don't get recorded. So it's been an interesting way to experience and test out some ideas I've had. So I'll be doing follow-up conversations on Clubhouse. So look for that coming soon. I'm at Harry Duran on Clubhouse. So let's make sure we connect there as well. As always, full show notes available at podcastjunkies.com forward slash 253. This episode is also brought to you by Fullcast. Fullcast Fullcast.co is the website. If you need help with any aspect of your show from launch to production and marketing, we can help. Schedule a free chat at fullcast.co forward slash chat 15 about your existing or new show. Stay to the end of the episode where I reveal the weekly retention hashtag. It's my way of seeing who listened to the end. But for now... Let's talk social impact with Nital. So Nital Parekh, host of the Impact Podcast by Innovate Social. Thank you so much for joining me on Podcast Junkies. Thanks, Harry, for having me. Great to chat with you again. And what's it like today? Because I can talk about the weather here. It's mid-20s. I'm in Minneapolis now, so I have to get used to things like walking on lakes and seeing people snowshoe and cross-country ski on frozen lakes. <laughs> so I'm always curious when people are in warmer climates, how things are going for them. Yeah, wow. We've been, yeah, lots of places are getting tons of snow here. We had a lot of rain last week, but it's been pretty sunny today yeah. in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. How long have you been in the Bay Area? You know, I've been here... About over a decade, maybe 12 or 13 Mm. years now. So a long time. What do you like most about it? You know, especially when I first moved here, the idea that a lot of ideas are coming up here that are galvanizing, are catalyzing, are connecting, are kind of colliding and forming new ideas. That was very exciting. I feel like many places have something that ties them, like, you know, whether it's Wall Street and financials or maybe Paris and fashion. And I feel like here it's this ideas and that growth. And that's kind of an exciting energy to be around. Naturally, there was more opportunities to physically be around the people and the places and the businesses creating those ideas. The past years demonstrated that that's been a challenging thing to do when you can't get out and when you can't meet in public. So I'm wondering what the impact has been for you over the past year now that we've had almost close to getting close to a year to like look back and see the impact of COVID. So I'm curious what the experience has been like for you. Yeah, you know, for my work in social enterprise and entrepreneurship, it has meant thinking about how to bring things online and virtual and still create meaningful experiences. There has been a reconnection with creating content, but maybe different content. I think, and I wonder for you too, I find, I think, I feel some of of my most deepest moments of fulfillment when I'm creating content, like whether it's podcasting or writing or blog posts or, you know, so I think some of there's been some interesting, you know, content creation. And then on a personal level, and that's happened more recently, like not, it didn't, it wasn't happening necessarily the whole time during the pandemic is forming more practices that I hope to keep up, you know, even when we're not exact in this space, like a daily yoga, meditation, kind of breath work practice. So yeah, so some different things, yeah. I'm kind of curious for you, too, just to learn <laughs> similarly for you. <laughs> well, someone asked me earlier, it, it was an interesting and emotional year. So initially, COVID, right, that hit first. And then I live in Minneapolis. I'm new to Minneapolis, been here for about a year and a half. And George Floyd happened here. You know, the, this is the epicenter of that movement that took place. So it's fascinating to be here while that was happening. I actually participated in the march. But I also was a block away from a whole neighborhood that got looted. So, you know, actually had to leave for like, you know, three days to like, you know, because just wasn't sure if it was going to be safe to to be here. So run the gamut. My best friend from high school passed from COVID. And, you know, we'd fallen out of touch. We hadn't been touched, but, you know, we, I turned 50 last year. And so we were the same age and that's when it really hit home, you know, and, and thankfully my, my family has been okay. And obviously since I've, I've known a lot of people that have had it and recovered, but that was, he didn't make it. And it was sort of put things into perspective for me about the impact of it. And, you know, just hearing the stories of people and places upended has been fascinating. The reason we picked this neighborhood uptown in Minneapolis is because it was close to restaurants and places, barbershops, and just places you can walk to. And I grew up in Yonkers, New York, just outside New York City. I've lived in New York City. I've lived in LA, and I like being around places I can walk to. (laughs) 
Yeah. And uh, that no longer happened for that, you know, like a good six, seven months. And the Apple store that was here is not coming back. They got looted. They decided not to return. A huge restaurant here opened for 20 years is not coming back. And then multiply that times tens of thousands of stories throughout the country and throughout the world as well. So it's been interesting to see what we thought was, what we took for granted, I think. We've had a need to reevaluate that, what's important for us, and things like companies putting an importance on having employees in the office. Like <laughs> that was used to be a thing now. And forcing everyone into this experiment to see what can be done remotely has been fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear about your friend that, you know, a few people that I know have battled COVID and yeah, it's, it's very tough, you know, and it's something that after we finish this year, that is something that we'll have to carry forward is that there are people that aren't joining us in that post pandemic, you know, part of this. So it kind of is, it's like, yeah, it's a reality. And yeah. And did you move during the pandemic or did you move before? No. Oh, before. Yeah. I was here before. So we had been in the apartment for a year okay. and <laughs> so we had recently renewed the lease and we we're like excited and then uh, now we're like oh we got to stay here until august so, right. <laughs> because when everything's closed around you then things like backyards start to mm -hmm. become like in patios start to become like you know very valuable real estate that <laughs> it's, it's important to think about how important was uh, your yoga practice i saw that you've, i couldn't help but notice the 200 hours of certification but i wonder something like that is must be pretty valuable as a coping mechanism yeah. And, you know, I think it was like, you know, kind of meant to be, but that, that was the last trip I had made before the, the lockdown and pandemic was doing the yoga teacher training in Bali, which was like itself a life, you know, shifting opportunity and once in a lifetime opportunity to do that. And then to kind of come into this place and then kind of be in lockdown. So in some ways, it feels like I can think back and it was literally a year ago this week, th these last two weeks is when, you know, before March, before the, a lot of the lockdown. So I think that has been really helpful. And it's also been whenever you learn something in order to teach something, you also feel like this, I don't know, for me, I feel, what can I share? Even though I'm, I'm not, you know, doing a yoga teacher training doesn't make you an expert, you know, you, it will take years and years, but there is something you can share from just that immersive experience so i've been doing some of like some of that on instagram is like sharing some of that on a dedicated handle and like you know create it's almost a way to play with with that of how can you make that because it has been so it has been rewarding for me so how to share some of that in the easiest way and it's taken me decades to get to this point where i could even think about having a daily routine so also just inviting people to start where they are and not feel like, you know, you can look on, on these different, you know, websites or Instagram pages and feel like, oh my goodness, I don't look like that. I can't move like that. I can't. So I, I'm not a yes for yoga, but I think it's, there's so many benefits for wherever we are. So. When did it become a passion for you? You know, I think for the last maybe seven or eight years, I've just, I've been a yoga a very inconsistent or non-consistent practitioner, but just, you know, going to classes when I can. And then a few of my friends did the, a yoga teacher training and really enjoyed even the training because it's like 200 hours. It's like, you know, six or seven hours or more per day of yoga. I have different kinds of yoga, but in a way, it's such an interesting way to learn because you're, you learn philosophy, you learn different styles of yoga. And it's almost like if you like yoga, you just really enjoy it because you get to do that much, you know, yoga and, and kind of just be around people who are interested in that. So I think yeah, I, I felt like um, I wanted to like start off the year and maybe, ha you know, start with that, you know, kind of thing. And who knew that that would you know, <laughs> be a lot of the year. But yeah, but it was a cool thing to have done. So. I studied Buddhism years ago, and so that was helpful from a meditation practice. And then the I think the most consistent practice I had is when I lived in LA, I, I found Kundalini Yoga, which is extremely helpful and powerful. And uh, so I haven't been able to, to pick that back up. And I think there's something about the discipline of having to get out of the house and go to a studio and, and you know get on the mat. And it's been trying to replicate some of that virtually, but it's not the same. But thankfully, I have picked up like a, a workout practice. So my, yeah. my partner and I working out four days a week. So at least we get the body moving that way. Exactly. No, I think whatever kind of rituals or practices that move our body that kind of can help us kind of move our breath and, uh, and our thoughts, yeah. I think can be really helpful. So that's, that's really awesome. Where were you before you moved to the Bay Area? In Southern California. Okay. In Orange County, yeah. And where were you born? 
I was born in Oklahoma City. So, mm. yeah, and my, both my parents are from India. And so, yeah, they had, and then we've moved around. I moved around a lot growing up because my dad is a civil engineer. So we, okay. we moved every few years. What was Oklahoma City life like growing up? <laughs> you know, we didn't live there for very long. It's just, okay. um, you know, because we were moving around a lot. So, yeah. yeah, I don't have any, I don't, I don't have any clear memories of living there. <laughs> okay. You know, we were. Interesting. I'm curious when you decided to uh, formalize like your schooling and deciding what topics you'd be interested in, this idea of you know, social change, social impact, is that something that was top of mind for you at a young age? Yeah, that's a good question. I do think it was, it's been part of maybe my, it's been on my horizon. And maybe some of that is also having family and, and you know, traveling to India, also living in different places in the US and abroad, you start just seeing equity. Maybe you don't even have the name for that, but inequity and equity in, in a different way. And so I think I was just drawn to some kind of impact kind of focus. And then also with the international lens of having like an international sense of the world, just because of traveling and moving different places, that also played a factor in that. And so I noticed a lot of the activities I did in high school, the clubs I was part of, the, you know, were all, were a lot of them around impact or being around other people who had that kind of service mindset or, you know, impact mindset. And that led to uh, college and then figuring out what the, what I wanted to do in college and led to like international political science, thinking maybe United Nations, some, you know, something around that in that way. And then looking into law and then pursuing that and also with that lens and then kind of seeing the intersection after schooling and moving to the Bay Area, the intersection of law, business, startup, you know, and social enterprise kind of came together. What's your fondest memory of university? I think definitely spending time with my friends. We made, yeah. I made some, like, have an amazing friends group from my time in undergrad. And, and because we had moved around a lot, I didn't have so many friends that, oh, this was my friend since yeah. kindergarten or something like that. So in college, those friends to this day are some of my, you know, closest friends. And I really, you know, yeah, how about you? Uh, and, and if, uh, you have to remind me where you also went, uh, where your path went. I was born in El Salvador. And then I, but I came here when I was a year old and then grew up in Yonkers, New York, which is just outside New York City. So it's, it's for those looking at a map, it's Manhattan, the Bronx, and then Yonkers. So it's, I literally had it, my eyes on New York City since it's, when I turned 17, I got my license. I'm like, hang out in the city. So I have a, a definitely part of my heart is always going to be in, in New York. I'm a New Yorker at heart. Mm -hmm. I lived in Atlanta for a couple of, of years. And then in 2014, I was married at the time, moved to LA. So I lived in LA for four years. So very familiar with the West Coast climate. I used to think 55 degrees Fahrenheit was cold. And now I'm in Minneapolis. And, <laughs> and when it's like 30 degrees, and I'm like, oh, it's not too bad. So it's all. So definitely you've had the big city experience. Now interesting here being in the Midwest. But nothing is set in stone. I think we're looking at other places to live. And I left college early, only had a year and a half of college, so I didn't get to develop those deeper relationships. So I think I do have some of that experience of like meeting a lot of friends casually over, over the years. Interestingly enough, through podcasting, I think I've developed a lot of relationships and friendships because I go to podcasting conferences since 2015 and start to see the same people and, and build up relationships that way. So it's it's funny. I think the path that we usually end up on is probably not the one we we thought we would have had if we had a mm -hmm. chance to reflect on it at a younger age, but it's probably like, uh, not to wax too ph philosophical, but the one we're, we're meant to be on. I think so. Yeah, I absolutely believe that. <laughs> what were you thinking as you were wrapping up university? Like what type of companies did you want to work for? I imagine something that was mission driven that was going to fulfill you was something that was top of mind for you. Yeah. You know, when I finished, my undergraduate studies, I took a year before starting law school, graduate school, and did some in volunteer work in India and mm. different internships, just trying to gain some work experience and see, you know, where would I fit into a lot of this. And so that was all really valuable. And it was special to go to India and volunteer. My mom actually volunteered alongside. So we got to have that experience together, That's which nice. is very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so are there companies at that time that were a model for who you looked up to in that space? And that's a good question. So, well, you know, when I finished uh, graduate school, 
I think it was starting, like there's definitely CSR, the corporate social responsibility has been around for a while. So you have a lot of foundations. There's a long history of foundations and, you know, really interesting work, you know, happening along those lines and companies that are, you know, in like creating products that are benefiting people. So that was all there. But I think what we didn't see that we are seeing now is companies that prioritize impact, you know, equal to their profits or, you know, that they really kind of, that impact is part of every transaction. It's not, it is very core to the DNA of the company. And that's what Mm. I kind of look at when I think about social enterprise. Is that the level or is that the commitment to impact? That it's, it's almost like another factor of success of that company. Not, it's not like, oh, and also, hey, look, we'll look at the impact that we made. It's like a checkbox. Exactly, that it's kind of closer. And, and I think the reason why maybe my work ended up being focused on earlier stage social enterprises is that when you're starting a company, some of those decisions, though they're complicated and complex, are easier to make than when you have a company that's 10,000 people strong, you know, and that has a lot of history of the way that it's done things and supply chains that are established but when you start some of those decisions, you can start with that in mind, you know, and that can kind of influence the kind of company that you that you build. So when you were at Stanford, you were an instructor of social enterprise. And so are these things that you had learned and then you were teaching other people how to how to run a like a, an actual company that adhered to those types of principles? Yeah, you know, by that time I was I had the opportunity to teach uh, for two summers at a Stanford summer program. It was I had been doing my work for the better part of a decade, you know, and and I had written the book, had been doing podcast episodes and in workshops and and events at universities. So it was there was more maybe to share curriculum wise, and also you know so much of of when you're sharing some of this is letting people build and create and then checking in with them. Like, you know, like kind of being part of that process versus, mm-hmm. you know, if you do a one hour workshop at a university and then you're like, all right, good luck, everyone. You know, tell me how it goes. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's a different engagement. They're both important, but I think this provided us ways to kind of see the students through, you know, support them at different challenge points and to share more you know, different methodologies, different worksheets, different tools that could help them dive deeper into their work as well. So, I think what might be helpful for the listener is understanding some of the terms that commonly get tossed around. You mentioned, uh, you know, CSR. And so maybe if you could define that. Also, the other term is B Corp, I think is another yeah. one familiar. And if there's any others that where, you know, they're sort of used interchangeably, I think a quick primer might be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So starting out with social enterprise, which I think is the the kind of the larger, um, you know, is one of the larger umbrella terms under, under which some of the other ones fit under. And so social enterprise, I just think of that as using business models to create social impact. So you could be a nonprofit a social enterprise as well, but just that there's some business model around the impact. So that maybe is different from like a charity, which is, a, you know, 100% charitable donations. And there's that there's a need for charities as well, especially when, you know, if there's a disaster or relief, like you don't necessarily need there to be a business model, there's a relief and a very need and necessary purpose for that entity. But for social enterprise, there's that idea of how is that company or organization also looking at their own sustainability, you know, so that's one part of it. Uh, CSR, as you mentioned, is corporate social responsibility. So a lot of companies and at the corporate level, they have initiatives. And that area is really built out. It's been around for a very long time. And if you think about it, if a large entity like a company make a small change in their supply chain, like Walmart, for example, I think there's a, a history or an article or a situation where they decided that they wanted more fish that were kind of from, you know, li- uh, wild caught or yes, wild caught, yeah, like yeah. yeah, and they couldn't find enough certified fisheries to meet their demand because they're such a massive entity. So you know, so some of that can be mm. you know at play too. And then B Corp and Benefit Corporation. Benefit Corporation is the legal structure for companies that are for profit and also for impact. And B Corp is the uh, certification. So it's like the fair okay. trade or the and you see a B with a, a line underneath it, and that is something they have to apply for. A company mm. have to apply for you know fill out and you know and kind of kind of be audited a little bit fill out a, okay. uh, a a questionnaire and score a certain percentage in order to be able to be eligible and pay a fee and then they can use that the b symbol on their products it's almost like leads certification as well right yeah exactly per- yeah exactly do you find that the 
things are getting better with companies that in the past, I think in the, because you'd have companies that were supposedly doing things that were sustainable and for the environment and be like oil, like Shell doing a, <laughs> like a commercial about the sustainability and being a fossil fuel company, just as like an example. And then the term greenwashing comes into play where people are just like, on one hand, you know, on, on the forward facing side or, or the public facing side and say, hey, look at all the good we're doing. But if you really dig into it and seeing what they're doing as an organization, they're really like, like not doing good for the environment or, or for the world at the whole. And so do you see that with all the visibility now to companies and websites and where you can see how stuff was made and, 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 and you know, these companies trying to create these supply chains that are like zero emission, zero waste I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, no, I think definitely there's a whole movement. And I think a lot of it, which is very exciting, is being driven by consumers. We call it conscious consumerism, where people really care about the products and services that they are purchasing or, you know, engaging with. And so they drive that. Like, And also it's, it's you know, in the world of now that we have Reddit and all these places where people can have these sub-conversations that go really deep there's you know you cannot <laughs> people will call you out on that if you you know appear to be something and then are not so i think there's a social media audit that can happen beyond another you know more formal kind of audit on, on using and sometimes social. real time in real time exactly <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so I, I do think that there's some you know of that i'm sure there are ways that you can measure like what is the true impact or if there's you know I don't know that we've exactly figured out that there's carbon offset numbers that that can help us look at certain things around climate change, but to have a number around what is the impact, its impact varies and is in so many different forms. But I would say definitely as we work with more young people in our programs, that is such a thing on people's minds is the especially on, when you talk about climate change and, and the planet. It is like even my seven, you know, uh, seven year old nephew is like concerned. He, you know, read something by Greta Thunberg and is concerned. And so that is very real, I think. So to if you just look at what the concerns are of the future consumers, even if people go on to have jobs, like they are very aware, you know. And kind of more involved, I think, than than maybe we we were, you know, consumers were in the past. I speaking of Greta, I think I just saw something trending on Twitter that she's involved in India now and and make, give, bringing awareness to the situation that's happening there. I don't know the specifics or if you know anything about what's happening there now. Yeah, there's a big. I don't know deeply, but there's a big protest happening by many of the okay. farmers in India, and I just saw that she maybe had posted on her social media. Yeah. So yeah, that that's a huge, you know, kind of it'll impact things that having yeah. her voice in the conversation, and maybe that'll allow people to come to the table and have more conversations. So that's pretty yeah, remarkable. I think she's uh, polarizing. I think because she's <laughs> for some people that are you know are not comfortable with her message, you know that they're. Uh, it's certainly affecting them. But I think for a younger generation, I think it's really exciting. And you mentioned your eight-year-old nephew, like you know, to see people like that and it inspires them. And the fact that these conversations are, are happening, you know, at home, at the dinner table, you know, kids asking their parents, why do we eat this food? Or why am I eating meat? Or just kind of like, you know, just this, they're almost born. It feels like this, every new generation is born almost like more aware, which is fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. When did you know that you wanted to start Innovate? And and how long had you been thinking about that idea? Yeah, I had been at Fine, uh, yeah, I was at a legal directory website. And then after a few years, had kind of through that was doing a lot of social media and, and, you know, content creation on on the writing side. And after a few years, kind of learning about social enterprise, I felt like that was the place I wanted to, I, I really felt like I, I needed to be or I wanted to be. So I took a leap of faith after a few years and uh, ended up starting Innovate Social as a blog that was tracking some of the social impact uh, legal trends, you know, around the legal, the new legislations or that were passing for benefit corporation in California and other states. And, and then that kind of expanded to being tools, content and resources. And uh, now we say to make social entrepreneurship more accessible, actionable and transformative. So that's kind of our mission. And that's how I always judge whatever the content we're creating or whatever programs that we're we're involved in is it meeting that goal is it doing that thing of making that the space more when you started the company did do you have a an idea of how you would want to structure it organize it like what type of team members you would need if it, if it was going to be something that was going to be 
marketing focused, initiative focused, partnership focused. I'm always curious from an entrepreneurial perspective, like how you think about what direction you want to take the company and as it starts to grow. Yeah, I you know, that was a big question for me because I had started out as a blog and was looking at content. So, you know, I remember even talking to people that were that were kind of giving me some advice or support or just kind of pitching them what I was working on. They were like, so what is this? Is this like a media platform? Is this like a services? You know, are you building tech? Like, what? what is this? And sometimes I, I knew the bigger why. I, had, I mean, the mission was there, but then figuring out the how, I wasn't exactly sure what that what that form would take. And so I think over time, it's been more clear that this is, especially once we started doing the impactathons that have a more clear like engagement model, you know, where it's like a program, it's an event, then it's it's kind of been more on the service model side, like, you know, that it's services industry. But I, I there are some like goals of building technology that can support once we, you know, as we identify the gaps in some of these communications and, you know, so yeah, so, so I feel like, yeah, that, so it's the content supports the programs and then the programs may inform the technology that if we kind of create something that's more virtual or ta- tech or app based. When did uh, podcasts come on your radar? Yeah, so the podcast, it was a very organic process. And I'm actually curious for you too, and we've talked about this a little bit, but I want to hear your story and your side of this too. But for me, you know, I f- started out with just realizing that a lot of the stories of social impact really creative people and like professionals that were finding unique ways to incorporate social impact into their work. I just, I feel like those stories needed to be told. Like they were so inspiring to hear. And so I literally would first write questions, email them, they would write responses and that would be a blog post. And that would be the first. And then I realized, first of all, people are very busy and they don't necessarily can write essays. And then also you miss their excitement in their voice of when they talk about the work yeah, that they're doing. Yeah. So then I just started recording them and I, you know, came across SoundCloud and I was like, oh, I need a place to put these, you know, so that I can listen to them and I can share them. And then I was like, wait a second, I listen to podcasts all the time. What like what will it take to make this into a podcast? So I figured worked with a sound designer and, you know, figured out that process and and you know, I still had SoundCloud for the, as the back end for a long time before moving over to a host. And but then, you know, and then it kind of just a lot of it is once you have a system down, a process of, you know, for me, I realized for editing and everything, if I could do it all on my phone using different tools, that meant me doing it versus not doing it. Like whenever yeah. I would try to edit on the computer and it would just get, so I found some really cool programs. I, I to this day do a lot of my editing on the phone. And after a while, you can, um, I don't know if you feel like this too, but you can see sound. You can see Mm, like, you know, like see ums. You can like, you can see (laughs) what that they visually, you can see what they look like. And so as long as you can kind of spot those. So yeah. And then that's kind of where it's been. And then of course the podcasting whole industry has just exploded and grown so much that I almost feel like I'm using systems that I set up years ago, but there's always space to improve. So I, I would actually love to hear your thoughts on that too, because you do this, you yeah, yeah. <laughs> have, but you also support others. So you're probably yeah. really incentivized also to, you know what the newest things are as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a forever rabbit hole for me because I listen, I eat, sleep and breathe podcasts. That's what I like to say, because I have my show. I started a second show in vertical farming where I interview CEOs of vertical farming companies called the Vertical Farming Podcast. And then Fullcast is our agency. We produce shows for clients. I listen to podcasts about podcasting. <laughs> I subscribe to podcasting newsletters like Pod News, which is a really, really good mm-hmm. podcast. And then now I'm building a marketplace for podcasters as well called the Podosphere. So it's like really finger on the pulse about seeing all these companies come in and out of the space as well. And what I'm interested in your the tech that you're using to do this on mobile, because I think an important thing that you raise is this barrier to entry. Like when people first get started, they're like, oh, mm-hmm. a lot of moving parts. Tech overwhelm is how it's described sometimes. So yeah, what are the apps? And, yeah, I'm and, so uh, my apps. Yeah, yeah. There's an app now called Backpack, but there was another one that was, you know this, I'm just totally forgetting because they the parent app or the other app is not there, but it was... okay. Boss Jock? Boss Jock, Boss Jock. Boss Jock, yeah. yeah. I was like, yeah. Jock, 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 Jock. <laughs> so that was a first a start. And, you know, at the beginning, I mean, I also was just recording on my the um, audio recording app on the iPhone and use, I mean, I was, it was very, like, I realized if I got too complicated, then I, then, and also 
it just wouldn't happen. So it was, it was a yeah. re- it was a weird thing if the switch was on or off, you know. So that, and then there's Twisted Wave, which I use for a lot of the editing. Okay. And then I still now use Backpack, which is the cousin of a Boss Jock to publish. Okay. So I can I can do the um you know FTP and everything from there. I'll make sure I get those links from you because we want to put them in the show notes as well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I don't even. But again, I feel like people probably have like way newer links and newer tools. Well, that I, they I use, think what's so. the important thing, the important takeaway there is, you know, one of the things my coach talks about is perfect is the enemy of done. And so like, it's never going to be right. Every podcaster hates the sound of their voice when they get started. And so I think just having that mechanism for like, how we take imperfect action, and it was more important for you to get the ideas out and start the show and, you know, improve it as you go along. And I told even even starting with SoundCloud, because that would make like a podcast producer cringe. You'd be like, wait, <laughs> like you don't want to host there <laughs> like that one. And people that start on Anchor as well, because, you know, they dynamically insert ads in there. So just like, but at the end of the day, I think removing those barriers to entry into people to just like, you know, validating an idea. Is this something I even want to keep doing? And just so if you try to get, you know, get on your your podcasting high horse and say, hey, this is the proper mic and this is the proper technique and this is the proper host. I think it'll discourage a lot of people. So I'm all for the approach you took to figure out because what you wanted to say was more important than, you know, what mic you were going to use. And then the fact that you were talking to your phone is, is just great. So uh, and what what have you changed now in, in terms of your production workflow? Yeah, you know, now I... I can record on my microphone using, and it's the fun, the great thing is now that we are all virtual, you know, before I was doing virtual interviews via Skype, but that's, there's, and I knew, you know, after a while you do podcasting, you know, the main thing that you're really trying to reach is the best sound quality that you can. It's okay. And even your wired headphones are fine. Like to yeah. pick up I, what I, I still, if I'm podcasting out in the field or whatever, then I will take my, you know, these are not AirPods, like just the wired, you know, headphones from Apple and just put um, yeah. a- Yeah, earbuds, yeah. Yeah, earbuds, yeah. And I, I'll, I'll just put a piece of foam around the, you know, uh, around the microphone. And that will be, at least it'll get, the quality is astoundingly good, like versus, you know, versus a lot of other things. And even I've, I've even tried microphones that I can use as a third party for my phone and the air yeah, um, yeah, yeah. earbuds just work better. So, you know, that's the trial and error. But so now if, you know, if we can use the microphone, use um, a pop filter, some of those things can all help. And yeah, and then now with um, the tools, like even right now, and, and you're an advisor for Squadcast, but we're on using Squadcast. There are great platforms that let you record both sides so you get yeah. the best quality from both sides. And that's a yeah. huge innovation that was now made available to everyone. Like that before that was, you know, you'd have to ask your guest to like, you know, record it on <laughs> record. their side. And, you know, now it's much more seamless. So I think all those things make for better sound quality. And where I think you realize that is as a listener, because if you listen to podcasts and you hear, you just notice that it's if you have to like kind of squint to listen or you have to, if you have a hard time hearing, as long as you can hear properly and it's fairly clear, then I think you can get your message out. And now there's so many interesting and cool ways to do that. And then also, you know, upload and, and do yeah. it all from your phone. So that's another thing. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's great. I love, and I actually really, in, it, it can be very meditative actually to edit mm. your podcast. It can take oh, yeah. a long time, <laughs> but it can be, it can actually feel like, I don't know, very like it can be a positive thing. I always tell new podcasters to do all, do everything you can yourself to the extent that you can for as long as you can. And at some point, it does make sense to get help outsource some of the editing, some of the basics that probably most podcasters, that's not their specialty unless you're an audio engineer. Thankfully, I had taken some classes in electronic music production. So I was using a tool called Ableton Live, which is an extremely like over complicated tool for editing podcast episodes because it's meant for like music production so my favorite analogy is it's like taking a ferrari and going to get groceries <laughs> it's just like you just don't need that much to do that but then the other thing is and for those uh, anyone that's listening and, and thinking of editing their show you budget about three hours of time so if it's an hour of a, of a podcast episode you it'll probably take about three hours to complete it early on but new tools like hindenburg let you edit at, at 2x or one and a half x so i can actually listen as i'm editing and if you're, if you're quick you can actually get a, a podcast done in a shorter amount of time and then the other thing is to listen to your episodes once they're published 
I don't do it as much as, as I should now because I've got so many other things to listen to. But in those early days, listen to your produced episode once it's available on the podcast app. Because inevitably, sometimes, you, you know, you think everything has been published correctly, but you may find something that, or correct something or notice a speech pattern that you don't pick up when you're hosting, but you pick it up after the fact when you're listening as a, as a listener of the podcast. Totally. I absolutely agree. I'm curious what you think. There's a trend towards like video content becoming more micro or short form content. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you see, you know, with all the podcasts that you work with, that if you're noticing that those kinds of trends too, where there's more shorter form content or. Yeah, I think so. I think it depends on, and I think it all comes down to the consumers or the listeners appetite for that specific topic. I don't think it's a, a blanket statement that like there's certain, like if it's a health show or if it's a business show or it's a marketing show, a lot of people are using the side-by-side -side video from, you know, a tool like Squadcast or something like Zoom. And the question is, do people have the the bandwidth and the, and the appetite to like listen to something like that, you know, and, and watch to, a video. So I think having the option to let people consume it as audio is helpful. The other thing, but I think to your point, shorter snippets are helpful. I've seen people experiment with taking, you know, anything from a 90 second snippet to three to five minutes and then putting that on YouTube and then assigning it to a playlist. Because what happens, I, I believe from what I've heard from the algorithm is that when that little snippet is done, the next snippet in the playlist will play. So it's a nice way for people because normally you get the next video prompt, video next one. And so having a way to, for people to quickly binge several episodes by catching like the highlight reel is something that's interesting. And again, you, you need a decent video editor, <laughs> a video editing resource to make that happen. But it, it is something worth experimenting, especially if you have content that is visual in nature, like if you're doing any, anything that's teaching and it pulls people in or, you know, you, you feel like you're more engaging on video, that might be helpful. When you got started, what guidance did you have in terms of like, how you wanted to host the show, questions to ask, format, what, you know, what were you looking for, for inspiration early on? Yeah, you know, I really followed kind of my curiosity here, you know, in, in the sense of even my lens into being fairly, also learning and being new to social enterprise, I, that became the lens through which I interviewed people and always, you know, would, you know, I, one of the last questions of my interviews would be like, how would you what advice would you give to someone else who's trying to navigate this particular space you're in? So it was almost like that, That even just knowing I, that would probably be one of my questions helped to kind of, this is, there's so many podcasts for different reasons and I love a lot of them. So this was less about being, you know, like, you know, having an opinion on things. It was more about it being informative and inviting and mm. explaining a certain topic or a life experience and finding place instances of resonance so that the audience could resonate with that and say, okay, yes, you know, and so even to this day, some people that have listened to the podcast or, you know, are fans of it will say, oh yeah, you know, when you, like the interviews with these people or when you would bring on impact filmmakers or, you know, that re resonated with me. And so I think that's kind of the, the form it had taken. And now it's shifted and it's, and I've also done to give a little bit of, um, I don't know, flexibility to the form as it goes forward. I think I create a lot of mini series. Like I've had some series with just me speaking. Mm -hmm. My my sister and I wanted to do like a, 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 a podcast series that we did like a, rather than launch a whole new podcast without not knowing what this was going to be at and before committing to doing, you know, an episode a week or whatever, we just kind of launched it as a mini series of the Impact Podcast and just launched episodes that way. So That's it just smart, yeah. allowed us to release them, you know, and, and kind of get them out there in the world and then just see what happens with them and, and then decide, you know. How have you grown as a host and interviewer since starting the show? I think I've, uh, and I wonder if you find this too, I think at the beginning, like the, you know, you, there are some great interviewers in the world, you know, so there was a little bit of like, imposters, I don't know, imposter syndrome, or just this feeling like getting out of the way and letting the, the guest speak mostly, like, you know, trying to have not insert too much into that. But over time, I think there's been more of a confidence and more like a of like whatever voice that I have to share that that might also be valuable. So I enjoy now conversations, you know, and that's why I, even the experiment with the Sister Talk podcast was fun because it was fun to have a co-host, my sister, and we were we just talked about different topics and we're laughing and we're sharing, and so that was new because you know I've not, haven't had a co-host in the past. So 
Yeah. And I wonder, yeah, I actually would love to hear your, your <laughs> thoughts on that. As yeah, well. it's interesting because I think you do get comfortable over time and it's not something that you can plan for. And I think it's it's just like gym, just like yoga, like it comes with the repetition and just feeling comfortable in your own skin, having conversations with people, leaning into that curiosity. Because I think at the end of the day, what I've found the common thread for a good interview is just taking an active interest in your guest, actively listening for something that the guest mentions or, you know, finding a thread to pull out if they say something interesting. Because the listeners there also, the, the listeners in the room with us, and thank you for listening. And because it's so it's always the three people in the room. And I always like to like talk to clients about that is the guest, there's a host and there's a listener. And if you remember that and clarifying acronyms or topics or things that you know might lose people because you don't want to lose people and what's been interesting with this new interest in, in a tool like clubhouse i don't know if you've been on the app mm -hmm. but it's i feel like it's training ground for podcasters because you can go in you have to learn how to talk about a topic you have to learn how to interview somebody if they're on stage with you you have to reset the room every 10 minutes because new people are coming in you have to watch the audience people are leaving and you're like whoa is my topic not interesting so it's really it's you have to be really on your toes you don't have to worry about gear you don't have to worry about recording and it's i found it pretty fascinating it's audio only so there's no video to worry about so it's been an interesting experience. I'm wondering what your, how long you've been on it and, and what your thoughts are. Yeah, I'm also new. And actually later on today, we're doing our first like like uh, room, you know, doing okay. a, like a chat on Clubhouse. But I think it's, like, I think of it as a podcaster's playground. What a fun way to like, because we already know we love audio. Like that's what, if you're podcasting, like I love the audio format. And so to be yeah. able to connect with people audio and to also it's not recorded so there's really there's this authenticity in the conversations and i've seen some amazing moderators like i'm yeah. like how i was like do they get trained like they're because there's a when you're new and i'm still new i still have a little party yeah. hat on on the clubhouse but you get to like you jump into these rooms of people who are not that much newer than you but they're yeah. like moderating and you know like bringing 40, people on the followers. stage and, <laughs> and then all of the and then all of the cool little uh, cultural terminology that's kind of emerged yeah. like the stage it's not a physical Physical designation. It's just whoever has a mic, a yeah. hot mic, or that has the ability to un to yeah. mute, uh, unmute themselves and and be heard. And that's kind of interesting. Even um, some of the fun things that I've developed is. If you're in the speaker, if you're on stage, basically, and you agree with something someone is saying, you just toggle your mic on and off. So it just is a visual cue of like clapping or snaps yeah. or something like that. So I think it's kind of created this subculture around this. And it's I think it's it's enjoyable. And I think also it takes yeah. we video was great. And I think that it had it has a space. And I think during the time of the pandemic, it helped connect people. But I think we also maybe made things into video that didn't always have to be you know, that they mm. could have been audio. And yeah. then an audio in some ways is an equalizer because then you're not also distracted by video. You know what I mean? You're not yeah, yeah. also taking in those data points and making, our minds are amazing. It's all, they're all thinking and making judgments and, and decisions. So if you just take that off, then you can just focus a little bit, I think, on what people are saying, you know? Mm. And, and I don't know, it's a cool. I'm curious to see, you know, how it'll evolve and grow too. There's people building up tremendous followings. I've seen some people with like, 10,000, 40,000 followers is crazy. And I think that the only caution there is what we've always said about all these platforms. Like, don't, it's nice to build a following, but get them off. Like, you don't never want to build your house on rented land or, or sand or foundation out of sand because they are the app of choice right now. It's definitely like the, <laughs> the most buzzed about app. But you never know, like, you know, people that build their followings on Instagram or TikTok or, you know, insert pod social app of choice. So I think uh, people that are smart are thinking about how to get people to the email list, which I think is the best way for a podcaster, like build up that following. And you can then you can figure out at that point, like have them download like a lead magnet or have them join a group. But as long as you have that email list, you then have that one to one connection with your listeners, which I think is important. And something you said earlier about getting feedback, I was curious you mentioned that you did get feedback on your early episodes. What form did that take? Was that emails or, or some other way they were getting in contact with you? Yeah, I think it would just be people yeah, writing emails or more yeah, personal on the emails than on more of the social media. I think social enterprises still, at yeah, that time especially, was still such a subsect of some of the more larger topics. So people were yeah. more connecting one-on-one -on -one or saying you know, who they might want to see on the show and things like that. So that's where we got a lot of our kind of engagement 
Yeah, and that feedback from it's almost like oxygen for a podcaster because it's so, so valuable. <laughs> like you just want you're just dying to know. And then the other allure of Clubhouse is you're seeing the audience or lack of <laughs> when you're in some of these rooms that you're just getting started. And I think it's fascinating. I would go to podcast conferences and wear my podcast junkie shirt, and then people would be like, "Oh, I've, I've listened to the show," and I'd stop in the hallway and be like, "Where did you listen to it? Like, where did yeah. you find it? Like, how did you like? What did you think? Like, you're just curious, like because you want to just." you know, rinse and repeat, right? Like yeah. get clone those <laughs> listeners and Absolutely. find more like that. A couple of other questions as we wrap up. I'm curious in this social impact space, if there's anyone that you admire, if there's anyone that's served as a mentor for you, that's been influential for you as you've expanded in this area. Within podcasting or? Yeah, podcasting or social impact, whatever comes to mind. Yeah, I mean, there's tons of people doing incredible things. And yeah, you know, someone that, I kind of learned about early on. She unfortunately passed away last year. Leila Jana, who is the the founder of Samasaurus, and yeah, so I think there there are incredible people. I'm, I'm trying to think of anyone in particular, but someone that may be on your radar that you may like to talk to for the podcast is Tony Lloyd, who is the host of Social Entrepreneur Podcast. Okay, and we have known him for years just because of fellow podcasters in the space. But it's really cool to see and really remarkable to see how he has really focused on the Social Entrepreneur Podcast and his mm. he's I think created another podcast as well. So he's someone that like like you is just like completely like is so knowledgeable about podcasts and also has built so much of his work in social impact and social entrepreneurship, you know, based on his experience in podcasting. So he's in, he's a really great person and, and someone that would, I think you'd really enjoy talking with. Okay. As well. Yeah, definitely. can make that intro offline. What's something you've changed your mind about recently? I think, um, maybe some of this approach to podcasting and like, I think it, I was, you know, I'm now starting to create some like short form video content okay. interviews. And I felt like everything needed to be related to the podcast. Like I have to then eventually put the, the you know, sound files back on the podcast. And I think yeah, I just realized, yeah. no, those things can live separately because otherwise you don't know what you're building. Like you don't know if you are connecting with people or not, if everything is on, you know, and because of course true. we want to make everything accessible and, and everywhere. But I, I think when I just said, no, it's okay for that to live there and make and mm. kind of optimize it for that experience and then to continue the podcast in this, you know, in this form. And I, I think even for you, like, it sounds like you decided to create a second podcast because maybe it just didn't make sense to bundle it all into one. And maybe, you know, and maybe that's kind of a similar, an analogous decision to me also. Yeah. As I go forward. Yeah, the thing about podcasting and podcast hosts is you never run out of ideas to start a podcast because yes. you're just like, oh my God, if I did it for this, I could do it for this. And then you remember very quickly how much work it takes to do. Yeah. And you're just like, so thankfully we have a production company. So when I started the new one, the Vertical Farming Podcast, I, I knew the team would support me on, on the promotion. All I had to do was interview people. But it has been a fascinating way to just delve into different areas. So thanks for that answer. What's the most misunderstood thing about you? I think when you say you're doing social entrepreneurship work or social impact work, there's this kind of feeling like, oh, it's all like, you know, you're a nonprofit or you're doing it all. Like you're not building a brand. You're not trying to build a, a business or, or build something that is going to, you know, kind of grow in that way. And I think that's something where I'm seeing, you know, now I really feel my role as an ecosystem builder as well. Like, you know, I notice, like I try to value people in the ecosystem if they're involved in events that we're doing. And similarly, if someone asks me to do something, then I want to just ask, how are you valuing that work? And I think that's something where I love being, I love the social impact space, but it will not serve me and the many people who will come after me unless they find a, a path in this, like a viable kind of path. And so I think we have to stand up for that. You know, we have to stand up for that so that we create a, we make it easier for the next person. You know, mm. when they, when they ask, when they say, "Hey, how can you value me?" You know, yeah. or how how can I, you know, how can I be valued for doing this work? So I think that's something that is a clarity that is happening more now, which is which is kind of cool. Well, I felt the obviously as always the time flies. <laughs> We're at the top of the hour, so I, I'm glad we connected. We connected with, through a, a networking service called Lunch Club for to listen anyone who's not familiar with it. It's almost like um, just a, a random connector of, of people who are doing interesting things. So uh, I found it right after the pandemic, late April, started doing it, and I think I, I've clocked in about over a hundred. So it's been interesting, and, and I think you've had, and that's how we met. So it's it's just yeah, some sometimes funny when you just open yourself to just meeting new people and expanding your network. You never know where things are going to end up. And now you're on, on the podcast. So that's great. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you, Harry. Great to meet you, and I'm excited to figure out more ways to collaborate. And uh, yeah, really yeah, appreciate, yeah. yeah, are you reaching out? And yeah, this is the. I think it's continuing. We we started yes. to do lunch club, this, <laughs> so there's lots more that we can do together. I, I think so, definitely. <laughs> Where's the best place for folks to learn more about Innovates, the show, and yourself? Yeah, Innovate Social. You can just go to i n n o v the number eight social dot com. You can also go to theimpactpodcast dot com, and our handle is at Innovate Social on all the different platforms. So yeah, thank you. We'll make sure all those links are in the show notes as well. And I just have to call out your podcast host best practices because you spelled out innovate, which is very good because it's audio and people are listening. <laughs> they could be confused. And the fact that you grabbed the the full URL as a alternative for the podcast. So the impact podcast.com. This is those are like exactly the things we tell clients like okay. grab that <laughs> grab that URL. And like be conscious of like when you're saying something that people can't see it on paper, they're not sitting there with a notebook. So they're listening, they're on the go. So spelling that out is great. That's so <laughs> that was good. Thanks again. Have a fantastic day. Thanks, Harry. Thanks again to Nita for coming on the show. Much appreciated. Very inspiring conversation. Full show notes available at podcastjunkies.com forward slash 253. Intro and outro music composed by Cedar and Soil. Check out his fine, fine music collection at cedarsoil.com. Don't forget to check out our sponsor, Focusrite, and their awesome line of gear, specifically the Scarlet 2i2 Pro I am using in this episode. Podcast production and marketing provided by Fullcast. Sign up for a free podcast brainstorm at fullcast.co forward slash chat 15. Next week, we continue diving deeper into the world of podcasting with Brian Barletta. He's the host of the Sounds Profitable newsletter, and most recently, he's the creator of the Sounds Profitable newsletter, and most recently, the host of the equally titled Sounds Profitable podcast. Brian is a wealth of information coming from the advertising space, and it's been so interesting to listen to his perspectives on dynamic ads, advertising. He's a wealth of knowledge. I think you're going to walk away with a lot of interesting things to try with your podcast. I know I did as a result of this conversation, so that's going to be a fun one to check out actually later this week, episode 254. If you made it this far, you're no doubt listening for the retention hashtag. It's Impact Nital, I M P A C T N E E T A L. Tag Nital at Innovate Social. That's I N N O V, the number eight, social. And me at podcast underscore junkies. Thanks for all you do to support the show. Love you guys.